Good afternoon, boa tarde, bem-vindos e bem-vindas. Welcome to our event, uh, Pandemic of Inequality, Critical Perspectives from Brazil and the US. My name is Thomas Fujiwara. I teach economics here at Princeton University. I'm the Associate Director of the Brazil Lab at Princeton Institute for International and Regional Studies, which is hosting this, uh, this event. We are also grateful to our co-organizer in Brazil, the Institute for Mobility and Social Development, as well as our co-sponsors at Princeton, the School of Public International Affairs, the Program in Latin American Studies, and Departments of Anthropology, Spanish, and Portuguese. Uh, so the COVID-19 pandemic has exacerbated many of the disparities in equality in societies all over the world, along dimensions of income, health, education, opportunity, and mobility. It also put the set of public policies we have to address these inequalities under an uh, unparalleled challenge and raise all sorts of questions on whether it needs substantial reforms to address new challenges and achieve its goals in the future. While my previous statements apply to most, if not all countries in the world, today we learn from a comparative, comparative perspective, focusing on both the American and the Brazilian cases. And we do so with the help of two incredibly distinguished scholars that we are very lucky to have Uh, with us today, Sir Angus Deaton and Ricardo Paz de Barros. Uh, Angus Deaton is the Dwight D. Eisenhower Professor of Economics and International Affairs Emeritus at the School of Public International Affairs and in the Department of Economics here at Princeton. He has received several awards and accolades, which are too numerous to mention in my brief introduction, including the 2015 Nobel Prize in Economics awarded for his analysis of the direct quotes from the Nobel Committee, Consumption, Poverty and Welfare. Uh, His scholarship focuses on the determinants of health in rich and poor countries, as well as on the measurement of poverty and equality in the US, in India, all over the world. And his two more recent books are The Great Escape, Health and Wealth and the Origins of Equality. For the Brazilians uh, listening at home, this book has been translated to Portuguese under the uh, title A Grande Saída. And also his latest book is The Death of Despair and the Future of Capitalism, joined with also our colleague, Peter Professor Anne Case. Uh, Ricardo Paz de Barros is the Instituto Ayrton Senna Chair at the Inkspur Business School in Sao Paulo. He has also received several awards and accolades, which are too numerous to mention in my brief introduction uh, here. He is a, uh, including he's a member of the Brazilian Academy of Sciences. His research is concerned with inequality, poverty, education, and labor markets, particularly in Brazil, but also across Latin America. And he has helped design one of Brazil's most successful, successful social policies, the Bolsa Familia Cash Transfer Program. So uh, this is our format for today. Angus and Ricardo will talk for about uh, some 15 minutes each and we'll have a discussion after that. For the audience watching from home, this is uh, important to know, the chat on our, our YouTube channel is open, right? If you just look down from the video you're watching, you, uh, there's a chat that you can, uh, it's open. So you can feel free to ask questions as the event unfolds. Our team will be collecting your questions, they'll forward to me and, uh, uh, And I'll select some of them to pass on to our speakers. Uh, so the event should, uh, will last no longer than an hour and 15 minutes. And uh, we'll start with Angus uh, Eaton's presentation. Angus, please go ahead if you can share your slides. Um, let's see if I get this to work. Is that working okay? Good, okay. Thank you very much. Um, Thomas, that was that was uh, terrific, and I think this is just a wonderful idea. Um, you know, two of the most unequal countries in the world, um, and two that have been suffering very badly from COVID, and actually talk to one another. I have I know a little bit about what's happening in Brazil, but not nearly enough, and I'm looking forward to learning um, this afternoon. So. Um, Let me start, I have an outline here. I'm gonna talk a little bit about familiar topics of income consumption, wealth inequality and labor markets. I want mostly to focus on health and the distribution of death during the pandemic, or at least in 2020, we don't have really data for 2021 yet. Um, and my main axis of inequality here will be between the more and the less educated. Um, I think a lot of this is familiar, um, has been true for a long time. Um, the, the division between those with and without a four-year college degree has been important, um, both in determining people's incomes during the pandemic and their health, especially along the occupational divide um, between essential workers and those who were able to work at home. And essential workers risked both their health and money or had a choice um, between them. Um, one of the things that has shown up 
differently um, from COVID than other um, recessions, if you call them that, um, is that they're usually worse for men. And in COVID, they've really been worse um, for women. Let me show you a picture from Fred, uh, the invaluable Fred. This is the difference between the unemployment rate for men and the unemployment rate um, for women. Um, it's usually above the axis, so that unemployment is worse for men than for women. Um, you can see in the 2008 to 2009 recession, um, a very strong positive um, spike. And then you can see during COVID after 2020, at the bottom here, you've got this very strong negative spike showing that unemployment rates were higher for women um, than for men. Um, the, one of the things I worry about the most for the long term, not just in the US, but around the world, is what's happening to kids, uh, especially poorer kids, in places where schools have been closed for very long periods of time, and the huge benefit that's gone to kids in private schools in many places, which have handled the pandemic much better. Um, let me... Um, there are also these very, very large government transfers, which were conditioned on income, so that I didn't get a check. I don't imagine Thomas got one either. Um, and that, if you appropriately measure it, had a big positive, or it, it helped <laughs> um, keep the rates um, of poverty down. And in fact, if you look at the slide from the Census Bureau, um, it's called figure four because that's their label and not mine. Um, we have an official poverty measure, which is shown here in brown. Um, and there's what they call the supplementary poverty measure, which is measured in blue. Um, we have this crazy system in America that our official poverty measure does not include transfers um, to people. So all the help that was given to people by the CARES Act and other things does not show up in poverty. And you can see the red line going up or the brown line going up. That's essentially what would have happened if there'd been no um, um, government action um, during the pandemic. The next slide shows that even more dramatically, these things are going in opposite directions. Maybe we'll get to um, do something about our poverty measure. Um, on the other hand, it is useful to look at what would have happened without government transfers and what happened after transfers, and transfers really helped. Um, they presumably reduced inequality. I haven't seen convincing numbers of that yet. But the thing to remember is that these are one-off payments um, that are all set to expire and will not be renewed in anything like the same form. In fact, the child tax credit is being debated as um, we speak. So whatever effects there have been on poverty and inequality are likely to change as we go ahead. So um, let me talk about this educational inequality and the work that Anne Case and I have been doing on deaths of despair. These, what we call deaths of despair, are deaths from suicide, from drug overdose, and from alcoholic liver disease. They're currently running, or prior to the pandemic, we're running 160,000 or so a year. Um, this is perhaps, you know, there are always people who die of these things but this is perhaps 100,000 a year more than there was in the early 1990s, for instance. Um, the thing about this increase is it's immensely disequalizing because it's happening almost entirely among those with a four-year college degree. You're pretty much exempt um, from these deaths of despair if you have a four-year college um, degree. Um, I'm going to show you a picture of what that's done to adult life expectancy, but what we'd expect, of course, is this pre-existing inequality between people with and without a VA, we'd expect that to get much worse during the pandemic, and that's what I'm going to show you. So here's the situation prior to the pandemic. This is up to 2019. This shows the life expectancy at age 25. You can't use life expectancy of birth for people because we don't know whether they're going to get a college degree or not. Um, but you can see this gap in 1992 was 2.6 years. Um, it's currently 6.3 years. And at least up until 2019, um, people without a four-year degree 
um, had falling life expectancy since 2010. This is two thirds of the population who do not have a four year degree. So you've got this major situation in which, you know, life expectancy has been rising for a century or so, and here it's actually falling over a prolonged period of time for two thirds of the population that doesn't have a college degree. So what happened during COVID? Did it get worse? Well, um, this is perhaps a lot to take in, but this graph has got young people on the top, that's 25 to 64, and it's got people 65 plus on the bottom of the graph. The men are on the left, <coughs> the left two panels, and the women are on the right two panels. The dark bars show what happened to people without a BA, and the gray bars show what happened to people with a BA. These are increases in mortality rates from 2019 to 2020. Notice all these bars are positive. Um, what are the groups we're looking at? The first one, these are ethnic racial groups. The first one is Hispanics. Um, the second one is Native Americans. They have NH in front of them to stand for non-Hispanics. So you've got Asian American, um, Native Americans, Asians, um, Blacks, um, many, that's people who tick uh, many races on the census form. And the last one are non-Hispanic whites. And what you can see here is everybody increased. The black lines increased by more than the gray lines, so that you were more likely to die of, or at least during 2020 than in 2019, um, if you did not have a BA. There are also these groups that were particularly hard hit, and you can see it's Hispanics, it's, a, it's um, Native Americans, and um, African Americans, Blacks. The other groups did much well much better, um, sorry, no one did well, um, but the, the groups that really did badly where there were these big increases in death rates were Native Americans, Hispanics, and Blacks. Um, now, if you go on and look at not these absolute increases mortality, but the relative mortality rates in these groups, you get just a completely different picture here, um, which is <laughs> these things are now pretty much the same. Um, there are two exceptions, which are young Hispanics um, or female Hispanics and female um, Native Americans. But otherwise, these bars are approximately the same height. So what that's telling you is that the mortality went up for everybody, but it went up pretty much in proportion to pre-existing inequalities um, for the BA versus non-BA. Now, it's often been commented that what COVID did by age was to increase the mortality rates. So young people got a small increase, old people got a big increase. So what's happened here is the BAs got a, a small increase, the non-BAs got a big increase, but it's pretty much in proportion to what the mortality rates were before, um, which to us is a stunning finding because we'd expect it to get much, much worse because the risk factors are much higher. And that's what you get. Um, for these um, young, these female Hispanics, young female Hispanics and Native Americans. Here's another graph which shows the same thing. These are the mortality ratios in 2019, mortality ratios in 2020, and they basically lie along the 45 degree line, just showing that the worst, um, the, the ratio of deaths from no BA to BA was about the same in 2020 as it was in 2019. And again, you can see the exceptions. Remember, there aren't that many Native Americans with BAs. So this you could think of as a, a you know, small population effect. Um, and they're the Hispanics. Now, one of the things that might be driving this, I, I've really gone through this slide um, already, is Sam Preston and his colleagues of Penn have shown that a lot of these deaths for um, African Americans and for Hispanics of the between 15 under 65 were actually um, not from COVID. Um, in fact, about half of these deaths were from external causes from heart disease and diabetes. Now you might attribute them to COVID because the other things that were going on that were caused by COVID, but they're not directly COVID. Whereas for Hispanics, 
where we get the expected result that the non-BAs do much worse relative to what the VAs relative to what they were doing before, and they were actually dying of COVID. So that may explain part of the paradox, but it's still extremely puzzling result. So the BA has been protected in the same way. So I think I, I've said all these things, so let me scoop on. No, I, I just let me say one thing at the end that the education inequalities are perhaps more fundamental than the disease environment. They sort of survived the disease environment. But notice that doesn't have to be true. And the racial and ethnic inequalities really changed radically during the pandemic, as we've seen. So one question is whether these there was a spike in these deaths of despair um, during COVID. It turns out really not. In fact, in the US, as in about 20 other countries for which we have data, suicides went down um, during the pandemic. Um, I have various stories for that, but none of them are at all um, definitive. Drug overdoses, drug overdoses went up during the pandemic. Um, but they were also increasing rapidly in the months prior to the epidemic. So we don't really know what's um, driving that. Let me conclude by saying a few words about wealth inequality. I think one of the most startling and disturbing things about the pandemic in the US and in many European countries too, is the stock market has done incredibly well. So the Dow went about 30,000 for the first time ever. I checked it today, it's around 34,000 today, and it was around 29,000 on the eve of the pandemic. So you've got this extraordinary situation in which people are dying in huge numbers, and a lot of protected people with wealth are getting incredibly rich. Now, this is true at the very top of the income distribution, the wealth distribution. So these are rough numbers that come from various sources that Bezos pretty much doubled his wealth um, by about 90 million. Musk, about the same. Um, Zuckerberg, only a little bit less. Um, so you've got a situation in which ordinary people, the less educated minorities, are dying. There have now been over 650,000 deaths in the United States while the people at the top of the wealth distribution, and not just them, but people like us, um, who are talking about American academics here, who have pension funds invested in the stock market, have done incredibly well during this epidemic. In previous, a previous analogy is what happened in the Second World War, in which many European countries took the view that you didn't want to stop people getting rich during the pandemic because you not pandemic during the war because you needed them to make stuff and you needed them to make material for the war effort but you taxed them very heavily in fact the labor party in britain in the second world war argued for what they called conscription of wealth to match conscription of labor the working people went to the war and risked their lives the rich paid taxes at the same time. We're not even talking about doing that as far as I can see. Finally, just let me show you the pictures. Again, this is division by education. These are numbers from the Federal Reserve, the Survey of Consumer Finances. And what these show is in trillions of dollars, wealth by education. So the big green swathe on the top is people with a college degree or above. Um, the lighter green is some college, then the yellow is high school, and the red one is no high school. And what you can see is at the very end of here, this, this goes up to the second quarter of 2021, this enormous increase in wealth here, um, almost all of which is happening between the college um, among those with a college education. So people with college education are not dying, and instead of dying, they're getting rich. They're getting a lot of money. And in fact, if you look back to 1990, um, the Fed's graphs are really wonderful. You can see that in 1990, about half of all wealth, and this is total wealth, it includes pensions, it includes houses, it subtracts debts, it does everything you're supposed to do. That half of the wealth, this was 50-50 in 1990, um, was owned by people without a college degree. And the first quarter of 2021, that is a little under 75%. So we've gone from half it owned by people without a college degree to only a third, only a quarter. 
and the two, the three quarters um, have done incredibly well during the pandemic while their less educated brethren um, died. Okay, I'm going to stop on that depressing note. Thank you. And perhaps we can hear cheerful things from Brazil. Thank you so much, Angus. Yeah, for, uh, yeah, yeah. That was a uh, great presentation. Uh, a lot to think about. Uh, so without much further ado, I'll, I'll, I'll pass the baton to Ricardo Paz de Barros, yeah, if you like to share your slides too. I think you're muted. So, so, so. Mute. Okay, uh, can you listen to me? Yes. Okay, so uh, thank you very much for the uh, invitation and uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. And uh, I'm going to try to talk a little bit about uh, what happens to inequality and uh, downward mobility during the pandemic in Brazil. And uh, I'll, I'll try to show you that children were the, actually the group that actually pay the highest price uh, uh, of this event. Well, uh, as uh, I think uh, 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 it's clear to everyone and was highlighted by Angus uh, in his presentation, uh, this pandemic, it's certainly not uh, uh, balanced across generation. It's certainly very, uh, 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 skill uh, towards, uh, uh, in terms of health, uh, it will affect much more highly the old than the working age population or uh, the children. And that's just because of the, uh, uh, and here I have this uh, table where I put the, uh, uh, the expected years that uh, uh, typically uh, a person in average age group will lose from the pandemic relative to the overall average. And you, of course, because the mortality rate is much higher among the elderly, even though they have uh, uh, fewer years left, even taking into consideration these two factors, uh, uh, they still are going to be losing more. So the pandemic, uh, to some extent, uh, if we do nothing, uh, will be uh, uh, much more, will hurt much more the old people than the other groups in the uh, population. Uh, and that's true everywhere in the world. Uh, well, I, I would like to highlight two uh, peculiar features about Brazil, one now and one later, uh, that makes uh, the um, the pandemic have probably some differential uh, inequality effects in Brazil. And uh, the first feature, which is quite uh, amazing, uh, is that, uh, and you can see here from the last column where we have the government expenditures uh, in terms of the average labor income of a working age adult. Uh, you know, what's interesting here is to compare the, uh, uh, this is the expenditure per old people and the expenditure per uh, children. And uh, even though the Brazilian constitution said explicitly that we should concentrate our uh, policies on children, uh, actually for each dollar we spend on education, transfer, health, of children, uh, we spend $6 on uh, an old person. So actually we, um, we, we have this, uh, and I think nowhere else in the world, we have a country that uh, uh, spend per adult six times more than they expend per children, okay? Uh, well, one of the consequences of that, uh, this, uh, skew uh, way of spending uh, government funds certainly have an impact on poverty. And here I give you the data on the probability that uh, each age group will be among the bottom 10% of the distribution. You can see the 
uh, poverty rates, the chance that a child would be poor, it's almost twice the average, because the average here is 10%. Uh, among the old persons, it's one-tenth of the average. Uh, and here I'm including all the government transfers and uh, everything. Uh, so it's, uh, 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 so the situation in Brazil before the pandemic is the following. Children are the poor, the old persons are the rich or less poor. Uh, the pandemic is essentially is going to hurt the most those guys that are less poor. But there is a technology that we can use to help the old persons. Uh, we cannot change the age profile of the pandemic, but uh, we can change the level by social distancing. But social distancing uh, will represent a cost for children and for the working age population. So by practicing social distancing, the working age population and the children are contributing to reduce the loss from the pandemic to everyone, but essentially since this loss is concent heavily concentrated on the elderly, uh, essentially on the elderly. So to some extent, uh, and the cost benefit of the cost benefit ratio here, it's extremely favorable. So certainly we should do social distancing and probably we should do more than we actually did. Uh, so it's not arguing against in any way to social distancing. It's just saying that it's to some extent a sacrifice that children and the working age population would do mainly of course, we we'll benefit everybody, but we we'll benefit mainly the elderly, which are the least poor group in the population. So we should do that, but we should also think about uh, compensating children and the working age population for this effort. So let's see what happens in Brazil in terms of the incidence of this uh, cost. Well, first of all, the social distance in Brazil was relatively, uh, uh, well, was effective, but was not uh, uh, um, as intense as we would uh, probably like, like it to be. But uh, uh, instead of having uh, a million deaths, we have uh, 200,000 deaths. Uh, and if you estimate this uh, using several uh, ways of measuring the value of life, uh, uh, the value of a uh, year uh, uh, of uh, healthy life and so on, we come up with an idea that uh, we lost 5% of GDP after practicing a lot of social distancing. I think we should have less than that. So we should have done more social distancing, but for the amount of social distancing we did, we have this uh, uh, health impact. So we did social distancing. That means that the working age population suffer. How much the working age population suffer? Well, we lost, uh, at some point we lost 10 million jobs, okay? The working uh, population in Brazil, it's about 100, million people, um, 95 and so are occupied people, are employed people. We, at some point in time in the peak, we lost 10 million jobs, taking the average of the year 2020 and comparing with 2019, we lost 7 million jobs. We reduced the number of employed people by 7 million, which 8% uh, decline in employment. Uh, maybe surprisingly, the average wage of the people that keep their job remains the same, or the, comparing the average wage before and after is relatively the same. And the inequality in the wages of people that were employed remain constant over this period as the 
last three lines uh, tell you. Uh, the bottom line here is that the main loss was uh, essentially the uh, employment loss. Of course, this employment loss brings an inequality because some people lose their jobs, other people uh, keep their jobs. So there is this uh, in extra inequality between have a job and not having a job. And more than that, we have uh, extra uh, inequality because people that lose their job were in sectors that used to pay low wages. And that can be, you can see in this graph where you can, we, we put in the vertical axis, the uh, percentage loss in employment and the horizontal X is the uh, uh, average uh, uh, wage. So you can see that domestic servants, restaurants, hotels, other service, they, they lose a lot of jobs and they used to be the sectors that pay the least. So uh, the poor, to some extent, it hurts uh, the most and the financial sector and the public sector uh, uh, were not firing uh, anybody and uh, the wage used to be very high in this sector. So uh, uh, there are two contributions to inequality here. One that the uh, some people lose their job, other people don't. Uh, and uh, uh, the fact that uh, uh, those that lose the job with high probability, they came from sectors that pay low wages, okay? But at the end, the uh, total income, total labor income in the country, the total labor income in the country declined essentially because the level of employment declined because the average wage remains the same. So actually the total labor income in Brazil went down by 8%. And that means 200 billion reais. So that is 3% of GDP. So uh, to some extent, the contribution of the working age population to, to reduce the losses in health was uh, a reduction in income equivalent to 3% of GDP. But one important thing, so here we get 5% of uh, health, 3% of uh, uh, labor income, but the government was very sensitive to this income loss because it was heavily concentrated on some workers. So the government did a, a gigantic government transfers to these people to help them uh, uh, to have a, a, a minimal income during this period. And if uh, we measure this, this, uh, 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 the loss in labor income in Brazil was $220 billion. The government transfers was $230 billion. So the government transfers to the working age population was larger than the loss in labor income. So to some extent, the government did in aggregate level did a good job in compensating the working age population for their income. Of course, uh, it remains to be seen and uh, the evidence that uh, it's available show that inequality was not increasing in Brazil over this period. So this money more or less went to people that actually lose their jobs, even though there are many, many uh, 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 deviations from that. But to a large extent, this was uh, 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 providing income to people that actually lose their jobs. So uh, actually the working age population uh, doesn't seem to be uh, 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 suffer the most because of this transfer. Who pays this for this transfer? Government debt. So who is going to pay this back? Children. So what's the result here? Children end up with 300 billion reais to pay back in the future. Okay, but what happens to children? Well, uh, over this period, remember children is the poorest group in the society. Children, uh, is, uh, schools were closed, nah? uh, contrary to the 
North Hemisphere in the South, uh, when the pandemic start, we were at the beginning of the school year. So actually uh, in Brazil, schools were closed 85% of the school year, 85% of the school days, you didn't have a school open. Of course, there was some kind of uh, remote uh, education. And in this graph, you can see that uh, if you follow all the activities of uh, the remote education, uh, students that did that, they lose 80% of a standard deviation in learning. If you did nothing, if you didn't follow anything, you lose 25% of a standard deviation, okay? On average, uh, uh, a child, a youth in Brazil, they follow 33% of what uh, schools ask them to do. And so the, uh, uh, the loss in learning in Brazil was uh, a little bit below 20% of a standard deviation. You may say, well, 20% of a standard deviation is this uh, small, is this large? Well, the point is this is amazingly large. This is very large. And the way to do this is to compute What's the consequence of that on the lifetime earnings of these children? And the, we estimate that that represents 9% of GDP. So if, uh, of course, this uh, uh, loss of learning could be recovered somehow. But uh, if this loss in learning is not recovered, this group of people will lose earnings over their lifetime. So the present value of that, it's equivalent to 10% of GDP, which is an enormous amount. So if we put here, we see the following. The highest, uh, 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 the, high, the highest loss was among children. And these children not only have all this loss, but also, is this children that has to pay all the transfers the government did for the working age population because that was an increase in debt that will be paid by these children or the children of the children. So, um, so this uh, uh, compensation of the orange box, you can actually put on the blue box. The question is, of course, the, this uh, loss for the children it's a loss in learning, and this loss in learning could be compensated somehow in the future. We are by the end of 2021, and up to now, Brazil has no policy at all to compensate this loss. So now, let me just finish showing you the last point um, in a peculiar uh, feature about Brazil. I was mentioned that the learning loss depends a lot on the engagement of the children with the education. And children that doesn't have any computer or access to internet cannot actually participate in the thing because all this is done in a, in a remote uh, fashion. So we, and uh, Brazil, as usual, measure very well uh, the, uh, social uh, problems, and we have very good measures on the engagement of children over this entire year. And we, we know that inside a household survey, so we can compute that and correlate with the uh, uh, background of these children. What we end up with is that some people don't have a 30% of engagement that has a 10% of engagement. And who is this guy? This guy is a black boy in poor families in rural area with uh, uh, less educated parents, okay? So this guy has an engagement that's one third, less than one third of the average. And on the other extreme, we have people that have almost 7% of engagement. They did 7% of everything that they were supposed to do. And who are these people? This is a white girl in urban areas in a high income family with well-educated parents. 
So what is the uh, uh, conclusion of all this is that uh, uh, the, uh, the legacy of the pandemic is essentially uh, the cost of the pandemic. It's essentially bore, uh, bear by the new generation, the children of today. Uh, the children of today, if we do nothing to compensate their loss of learning, we have a lower income. The new generation will have a much higher inequality because this inequality was not typical for Brazil. This is a new inequality for Brazil. So we are adding inequality to the Brazilian education system because some people have access to computer and other people don't have access to computer. This inequality was not really there in this extent. So we have a new generation that if we do nothing and we are not doing anything, uh, we'll have a lower income in the future or lower income than they uh, relative to what they would have a higher level of inequality and a great debt to pay. Because actually uh, uh, we did all this compensation of the, we did all this social distance, supposing that uh, nothing is really happened to children because of course uh, uh, nothing is happening in school anyway. So if they don't go to school, it doesn't matter. But uh, the point is it does matter and actually uh, Brazil is naturalizing this big uh, problem in education. And we have right now no education policy to compensate children for this gigantic effort they did to uh, uh, allow Brazil to face pandemic. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you so much, Ricardo. It was like uh, also, uh, uh, Fantastic presentation, uh, uh, a lot to think about, and a lot of like uh, similarities with what, what Angus said. So, uh, if we just to, to kick off the, the the discussion a little bit, I'll I'll ask you is a little bit one of my questions, and also merges in a question that João Bio sent through through uh, the YouTube chat box, which is the following: is, is I think Angus had a uh, started like with a very good turn of phrase, which was. Like what brings Brazil and, and the US together is that they are uniquely unequal and they're both uniquely uh, hard, hardly affected by COVID, but which doesn't sound like a coincidence. There must be something you know about the fact that these countries are so unequal and how kind of poorly they fare compared to its peers on COVID that's related. And I think you can see a lot of that in the in both presentations, right? Say in the US, you see this like 2020 was kind of this proportional shift in mortality, right? So like, which means, you know, the mortality for the people without BA had to grow much more than the ones with, with uh, college degrees. And the same in Brazil, I say, well, children were the poorest and then children were the, you know, the ones that were got hit the hardest by, by COVID. So the, my question is a little bit is, is for both of you, it is perhaps a little open-ended sort of not very specific question is, how do you see the fact that, you know, why the sort of, this country that are unequal or already so uh, unprepared to deal with, with COVID. Is it something really about, you know, the way the disease works and the way it is that sort of just exacerbates this inequality? Like say the people who, who are the poorest are the ones who kind of lose their jobs because they're the ones who can't work from home. Or is that some, something more complicated, like such as, you know, it's also about, you know, the politics behind it. You know, like say both Brazil, both in the US have, you know, the relatively populist, uh, 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 and also relatively authoritarian governments at the time. Is it that then the policy response was affected? So I, I just interested to hear your thoughts on this. So uh, perhaps since Angle started, if you could uh, speak first again, yeah. I think you're muted, sorry. Um, I'm now unmuted, thank you very much. Um, it's very tempting um, simply to say here, you've got two enormously unequal countries and they did incredibly badly. Um, during COVID. I, a number of people are saying that, and um, there's some, you can draw some graphs that make that look like it might be true. Um, I do think the politics is very important. Um, and, you know, the existence of uh, the fact that Donald Trump was in charge at the beginning of the pandemic um, had something to do with the extraordinary lack of sharing that America has done 
um, with its prosperity over the last 50 years with everything, not everything, but a, a grossly unfair amount going for people on the top. And about the only way that people up behind can get back is, is through presidential elections and through something like um, Donald Trump. I, I'll let Ricardo tell that story for Brazil. But I, I think we have to be very, very careful. So this epidemic is not over yet. Um, the death counts are far from done. Um, conclusions that looked very clear at the beginning of the pandemic um, don't look so clear now. Um, Britain, I think, has done worse than the United States. Um, Britain is a good deal less unequal than the US. And even though, like the US, it has someone who's often described as a clown in charge, um, it, it's not, it still had during the pandemic. Um, you know, a government that you would have expected to do much better than perhaps it did. I believe Peru is arguably the country that's done worse um, in terms of deaths, um, numbers, and the loss of life expectancy. But, you know, those numbers are just beginning to come in. So I, I know it's very tempting to say, hey, look, you know, <laughs> if we stand divided, we fall down divided too, and those things are causally related. And, you know, that hypothesis is certainly going to get a lot of investigation over the years to come. But I don't think it's clear cut in a very simple way. And a lot of it clearly works through politics and through the competence of the administration. Uh, thank you. Uh, Ricardo, if you like, yeah, like to share thoughts on this too. I think the uh, uh, Brazil follows uh, U.S. in many aspects. Uh, I think uh, uh, I think both countries were very slow and very um, not uh, uh, a great fun of uh, social distancing. So we um, uh, in this. Both countries have this idea of uh, private life and uh, privacy. It's a very important thing and so on. Uh, but, uh, but there's a big difference between, in the scenario that I present here between Brazil and the US. And, and that is related to the respect to education. So the US get a great respect to education. So Brazil, uh, everything was open, but the schools was closed. So bars, and restaurants were open, but schools were closed. Uh, that never happened in the US. And that had a, an enormous impact on uh, uh, education in Brazil. So uh, uh, Brazil is similar to the US in many things. There is a, a very nice study from the World Bank that compare uh, 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 the debate in the news about uh, vaccines and the debate about the news about uh, 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 the learning loss during the pandemic. And it's amazing that in the US, uh, in Brazil, people talk about uh, 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 lo education loss, uh, uh, eight times less in the press than in the US in terms of uh, uh, vaccines, we talk about uh, the same number of uh, articles and pages in newspapers. So, uh, uh, so the the relative unimportance that uh, uh, Brazil did to education it's uh, very peculiar and uh, uh, it's unfortunate, and uh, we have a very uh, uh, serious consequence. But I agree with Angus. Everything it's far from over, and the countries are changing. Uh, uh, position all the time, and uh, uh, Israel have a, a, a mortality uh, uh, extremely low. Brazil was very high, certainly Brazil and Israel were getting the same level of mortality rate. So it's uh, even though some countries like New Zealand and Australia are completely different uh, um, uh, uh, paths, I think many others are crisscrossing each other. We hope Canada is really uh, 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 taking a different path, but uh, uh, things are 
far from over and uh, we still have to wait to see uh, what happens. But uh, the lack of attention to education in Brazil, it's uh, very uh, uh, strange. Uh, not that uh, we closed the school so many days, but the fact that today we have no policy to recover this uh, uh, learning gap as if nothing actually happened. What schools are doing and just promoting children, just naturalizing that uh, there were so many days without uh, school. Can I just add a word to that? I think what Ricardo said is there is incredibly important. And I think, you know, we may have done a bit better, <laughs> but there's a lot of kids, especially poor kids, whose education has been very severely disrupted. And we're gonna pay a price for that for many, many years. Um, India is an example that seems to be even worse <laughs> than Brazil. And that, you know, the bars are open, the gyms are open, the stores are open, but the schools have been shut for 18 months. And um, these kids are just not getting educated at all. And especially kids who've never started school and who are gonna lose their chance of maybe ever going to school. And the problem there is like what Ricardo said, but worse, um, which is that um, the, the commitment to education by both parents and the state is weak to start with. And so you get this pandemic laid on top of that, and it's just an absolute disaster. And um, you know, this is the story we're gonna be telling for a very long time, I think. You know, yeah, thank you both. Yeah, I think it's absolutely that. And I think, I think you really, both of you touched on this, this, this issue, which is it, it, like, we're only going to see the effects of this in a very long time, right? Like this, when, once the children become teenagers and become adults and we can see their, 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 their labor market outcomes, their health outcomes, et cetera, we'll, we'll kind of go back and see like what are the, the harm of uh, the, the losses of schooling. So if, if I may s s switch a little bit here on, on the topics from, you know, sort of an assessment of the situation with both of you did fantastically more to be to the sort of the policy responses. Uh, I think I was just curious, like, what do you, you both perceive as a, say, what would be the type of policy that we would like these countries could pursue to best, you know, sort of address the situation or just to you know, improve, you know, on the different dimensions uh, 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 going forward, like what sort of is, is sort of missing in the, in the sort of public policy mix, both in the US and, 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 and Brazil uh, going forward that you would like to see. Yes. I'm, I'm a little less worried about the debt than um, Ricardo is. Um, it's not at all clear who pays for that. Um, and also given that the real resources um, that were used by those transfers would otherwise not have been used at all. So it's not as if these transfers were crowding out um, real physical production. And in fact, um, for many people, it was a lifesaver because they could go on eating and consuming and doing their daily thing um, in both countries. Um, so the financing of that should not, to me, be a huge problem. Of course, they can screw it up. The reason this is important, I think, is because there are lots of governments around the world, um, including here, who are going to use the debt run during the pandemic as an excuse for cutting services even further. So cutting healthcare, cutting education, cutting, um, and, you know, you know the, the Brazilian program is much better than I do. But that seems to me would be an unmitigated disaster if the right wing started chanting what it chanted, you know, after 2008, we've got to have austerity, we've got to get the government back in balance. Um, the other thing that's important for the future, and we haven't, neither of us talked about it in our presentation, but I think it would be good to talk about, is vaccinations. And, you know, it might well be that this thing will go on for a long time, and we're going to have to vaccinate against it on a regular basis. One thing that's becoming pretty clear here, and again, we're in 2021 at this point, so we have relatively little data, is the non-vaccination rate among the people without a VA is much, much, much higher than the vaccination rate um, among people with a VA. So if you go around Princeton, it's about 80 or 90%. If you're in Montana, where I was last month, it's under 40%. Um, and that is compounded by politics. So you've got a number of governors in various states 
who are basically trying to kill their population as far as I see them there. You know, arguing against social distancing, against mass mandates, against vaccination, even though they're all vaccinated themselves. So that, that this could be another huge divide. I mean, if there's a large number of less educated people who don't get vaccinated and don't vaccinate their kids once the child vaccines are fully available, then this is going to have a further divide by both sickness and um, death and um, money and you know we don't really know again for these kids how many of them if they get COVID how long the symptoms um, last so that there's a lot of concerns about long COVID and diminishing productivity in the future. Uh, Thomas um, um, no I agree with Angus uh, I, I'm not very concerned about the that in itself, I just think the current generation should try to pay this debt uh, and not necessarily leave this debt for the next generation. Uh, it just not, uh, but, but I agree entirely with what you said. I, I just want to mention one point that uh, uh, I don't know if Angus has a, a view on that, is that uh, uh, Maybe we are taking a pandemic that could be an event, a very sharp and profound event, and transforming. Some countries are transforming something that it's uh, uh, that is uh, 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 an intense phenomenon in a chronic uh, event. So if you uh, do a little bit of social distance and then the mortality rate declines a little bit and then you relax that and then the mortality rate goes up and then you strength that and then the mortality rate go a little bit down. So if you keep doing this, you never eliminate the virus. You never really control the pandemic. So instead of really fighting the pandemic and and take the costs that that would require, you actually transforming that thing on a chronic problem that it will be lasting for a long period of time. And I think the US is doing a lot of that. And Europe is actually doing a lot of that in many, many countries. Maybe the uh, Nordic countries are kind of moving a, a, a little bit in a different direction, but, uh, uh, that's certainly not what uh, Australia, New Zealand are doing or China and Korea are doing. I mean, they're saying, well, we have to fight this. Uh, let's uh, uh, try to bring this uh, contamination, uh, uh, this infection very, very, very down before we open anything. So uh, I don't know if that's a better strategy than this other strategy that the US is using, that it's actually making this a chronic problem that will kill a lot of people and maybe will, I think if we do the simulation, this will cost more jobs and more GDP than um, uh, uh, a very sharp uh, uh, fight, uh, uh, against the, uh, uh, the virus like uh, uh, China or New Zealand did. Thank you, thank you both, yeah, for, yeah, the, uh, again, again, a, a lot to think about. Uh, I'll just follow up, it's, I think, on something that Angus mentioned, and it also matches with a, a question he got from uh, Arminio Fraga and the, also through the, the audience, which is, is uh, uh, so his question was like, you know, uh, if the, you guys have any thoughts on the fact that, you know, Brazil is a less educated country, but, you know, uh, uh, the people are much, much more inclined than Americans to get vaccinated, right? So it seems pretty clear now that, you know, the, the share of Brazilians getting vaccinated is going to surpass the West. And it's, as far as we know, it, it may, you know, uh, like it will be like, you know, 95 or upwards of the, the, the eligible population. While in, in the West, within the US, you see the opposite, right? It's sort of not the opposite gradient in education, right? So of course, there's oh, many other things going on. But uh, I was wondering if you have a little bit of uh, thoughts on that. Like, say, is it 
is it this tendency of the less educated not to get uh, vaccinated in the US is really just the politics of it behind it and the identities people form around it. And of course, how it matches to things also in the death of the spares. And why say in, in Brazil, which is a less educated country, a country that had, it has its fair shares of conspiracy theories it is in fake news, the, the, the adhesion to vaccine has been so much more stronger. Yeah. Uh, Thomas, uh, in terms of Brazil, uh, I think uh, Brazil has a long tradition of, uh, Brazil has an excellent uh, vaccination program that dealt with many other diseases. So the Brazilian population, it's very uh, 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 used to get vaccinated and uh, have their children vaccinated. And the Bolsa Familia requires people to be vaccinated and the program uh, was always very well organized and so on. So Brazil, it's a country that has a tradition of people being vaccinated. So it's hard, even when the president is saying that the uh, vaccine doesn't matter, uh, people will not follow because we have this, uh, the, the merit here is decades of uh, 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 attempts to eradicate many infant diseases through vaccination uh, um, uh, with, uh, uh, surprising for Brazil, a very well-organized uh, program of vaccination. I think that's the, the, the reason for the success. It's, it's just a, a, a historical trend, it's nothing else. Yeah, I'm, I'm, it, it, here is somewhat of a mystery. I mean, most of these people who are refusing vaccines have children who are vaccinated. Um, and that's because most states in the U.S. will not let kids go to school um, without them being vaccinated. And in recent years, it's not been much of a problem. So there's a long history of people in the U.S. you know, being used to vaccination. Um, the vaccine resistance um, in recent years have been on the left. Rich people, not right. Poor people. So, you know, Marin County in north of San Francisco, California, um, huge vaccine resistance to mumps and measles um, to the point where there were really epidemics um, beginning to happen again. And it was because it went with the sort of leftist keep my body pure sort of thing. And now it's turned, been turned by politicians as far as I can see. And I mean, the vaccine resistance itself is not new. Um, I remember in one of the presidential debates for the 2016 election, um, the Republican candidates, even then, competed with each other to denounce vaccines. Um, and that was sort of a new phenomenon. And it's really come home to roost. I remember Donald Trump doing an imitation of a child with autism who'd been given a mumps vaccine. I mean, just horrible, horrible, horrible thing. And that certainly came home to roost. Uh, I, just this, on the strategy question, I mean, there is this issue of, of um, whether it's possible to eliminate it in one country while uh, uh, not eliminating it anywhere else. Um, the Chinese are still having outbreaks from time to time. If you go to China today, you have to spend two weeks in a quarantine hotel, a special quarantine hotel, and then you have to spend another week locked up in a regular hotel before you're allowed to go out and talk to anyone. <clears throat> and they're still getting epidemics. Um, Australia that thought it had gotten out from it is not out from it at all and is now desperately trying to vaccinate everybody. So, you know, this is a very complicated, unpredictable, I think the dynamics of the disease are among the most unpredictable things. And it's just very hard to look forward with any confidence. Yeah, thank, uh, thanks again. Yeah, those are, uh, great answers. Uh, so I'm just I'm reinterpreting a little bit a question from Guilherme Mora sent through the also through the chat is uh, like I, I feel like the the pandemic like, raises debates on how we do uh, distribution like uh, or, or, or or transfers of resources to people in, in need. I think some people can look at the sort of data both of you presented and say, well, there's clear groups of people who are hurt the most, right? like there's the poor children in Brazil, it is the African-Americans in the US, it's it's like, it's gonna, we know who are the people who are affected, so we should do policies that are sort of very targeted to them. And I think there's sort of, on the other side of the spectrum, they're saying, 
well, do, the, the targeting has been so hard, like both in Brazil and the United States, you know, like there's the stories of, you know, people who waited months to get their unemployment uh, insurance uh, uh, checks in the US because, you know, there's a very bureaucratic mean testing going on. And then some people say, well, we should have like a universal basic income. So everybody you know, gets something and they're sort of protected, right? So I was wondering from, from both of you, how you see this, like, should we think of policies being more universal, more, more specific, or should we be sort of, even uh, uh, universal basic income is a, some sort of idea that actually makes sense either in the US or the United or, or in Brazil. Yeah. So I've been going first. I think it's your Paris turn this time. I think definitely. Um, uh, well, Brazil has no uh, uh, budget to do anything really seriously universal. Uh, if we really do something universal, uh, we are going to be just spreading to thin the resources we have. And uh, I think the best way to deal with a crisis like that is to know very well who needs what. Uh, uh, so uh, there is no way to fight poverty without uh, knowing uh, individually uh, every poor. And Brazil already have 250,000 social workers in the uh, class, which is the center for, the reference center for social assistance that spread all uh, over uh, all municipalities in Brazil. We have uh, agents there and so on. So these people should be, and they do talk to families and they should be uh, uh, talking to families uh, 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 and helping families uh, uh, understand what uh, uh, each one needs and trying to help them with what they need. There's no simple basket. There's no, uh, I don't think uh, uh, income will solve all the problems because sometimes people don't need income. They need a, a place in a daycare center or a place in a, uh, uh, in a service that will take care of the elderly or uh, they need a, a uh, uh, training program or uh, uh, job intermediation program and, so, and many other things. So uh, uh, or help to uh, commercialize their products or, and, and so on. So I think the solution to all this uh, is to uh, get to know each poor, get close to them. And we have the, already the capillarity to do this understand what they need and make sure they receive what they need. This will be uh, uh, very cost effective and feasible and completely uh, opposite of uh, something like uh, 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 universal basic income that uh, 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 if you try to do with the budget we have, will be a very small transfer to everyone. And I prefer a large I prefer to give a large benefit for the few that actually need them to do a small benefit for everybody. So I can tell you one thing for absolutely sure. I don't know very many things for sure, but this thing I know for sure, the US is never gonna have a universal basic income. It just is not gonna happen. And if you have any doubt about that, just listen to what people are saying today when you've got at the same time people getting unemployment benefits while businesses have signs in their windows saying $15 an hour, $20 an hour, we'll hire anyone and pay them anything. And people get so angry about that. I don't think they should get angry, but they do get angry and they're not going to vote to pay people not to work or even to pay people when they're not working. So that's not going to happen. Um, the other thing about the different groups, um, it's sort of interesting, right, because the Hispanics and Blacks that have done the worst um, have, were doing pretty well before the pandemic. Um, so Hispanics have always had better health than whites in the U.S., and African Americans have always had worse health and die younger, but that gap has been closing very dramatically up until the few years before the pandemic. Um, when the drug deaths and so on began to really seriously affect African-Americans again. So 
I mean, it, it's if we can make this pandemic go away, <laughs> you know, I don't think we need to do that sort of targeting anymore. But I tell you what we do need, and we haven't really talked about it. I mean, we're unique among any rich country in the world and not having any sort of health system at all. Uh, one of the things that doesn't much get commented on, but it's just extraordinary, especially for a Brit, you know, I mean, I grew up in Britain and came here in later life, is there is no health system. Now, in Britain, when they had the vaccines, people got a card in the mail or they got an email from the national health system saying, you have an appointment at three o'clock next Friday to get a vaccine. And it was all perfectly handled and rolled out like clockwork. In the US, we didn't get vaccines through our health system. We got them from the army, or we got them from the state, or we got them from the townships. Doctors had absolutely nothing to do with it, the place you go and have your health care. Um, and that's because most people, well, not most people, but enormous number of people don't even have a regular doctor. Um, and so you just couldn't do this basic public health measure through the health care system because we don't have a health care system. So if we could fix that, that would put us in much better shape to deal with a lot of these issues as we go forward. All right, you got me on one of my rant topics, but. Um... That's so, so, an, an advantage so, of Brazil in, in relation to the US, right? Uh, we, we are closer to having a real health system and uh, a very organized uh, uh, way of getting the vaccine and so on. Now, in this sense, we, we are better off. In the lower end, in the lower end of the health, maybe we are better off. Yes, I, I, yes that was, yeah, I, I, also, I, I can uh, agree enough with both of you. Like yeah, I, I had the same as a migrant from Brazil then from Canada to the US, the same reaction, like how does this country does not have it? And, it, and again, it's speculative, but you can also think how that affects the non-vaccination rates. Like in a country, everybody interacts with their doctor and their healthcare and, and it sort of works relatively well for them. They're gonna trust, right, the, the vaccine effort, right? Why in a country where the healthcare system hasn't been working for a group of people, this group of people are gonna have all sorts of hesitancy, right? So we are pushing sort of towards the, the end of our time. So uh, I'll, do, I'll just let, let you guys, uh, uh, if you wanna have some kind of concluding remarks you'd like to say, or, or just add another point, I think something we didn't talk about that you would like to, to, to mention, uh, 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 please go ahead. Uh, we can start, switch the order now from the, the beginning. You can start with Ricardo if you have yeah, something to add. No, just to thank you for the opportunities for the opportunity for this uh, talk. I think it was uh, uh, very illuminating, and uh, 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 I think the uh, the major uh, challenge for Brazil uh, started as a health problem, and now we have an education problem that's greater than the health problem, and we have to pay much more attention to the education policy than what we are uh, doing right now. And uh, so I think that's uh, my major conclusion about Brazil, uh, because the, contrary to what uh, uh, happens to the old people that die, children, uh, st we still can uh, recover the learning of these children, even though children have a right age to, uh, uh, to learn how to write and to read, to, teach people to write and read in, a, in the wrong age, in the later, later on, it's not as effective. So we, we are in trouble, but uh, I think we still can, can do, but we have to pay a lot of attention to this and will cost a lot of money too. Uh, and my second remark comes from this point, to what extent should we do a, a sharp fight against, uh, uh, or should we, make this to become a chronic disease. And I agree with Angus that the, uh, uh, the lack of co international coordination, it's, it's really uh, a problem because if you cannot coordinate this uh, uh, worldwide, it would be very hard to uh, fight uh, uh, this disease uh, in terms of uh, uh, really uh, uh, solving the problem. We will be kind of living with the problem. But thank you very much. 
Thank you. Um, I'd also like to join in the thanks. I think this is just terrific. Um, maybe next time, if not through the Brazil lab, we could do this with like eight or 10 countries. Um, we could get sort of Peru in there um, and India and New Zealand and Britain, um, Sweden, um, all of whom have done very different things. And the range of outcomes is pretty extraordinary, um, even though, you know, there, there's some that's very explicable, which is that you're on an international trade route or all the Peruvians came home from um, Europe after their summer holidays or whatever. And, you know, so you, you have these events which started the thing off in particular places, but what happened after that? Um, it, it seems to have magnified these initial discrepancies rather than done them away. Um, one possible theme is, is not so much that it was inequalities that were amplified by the pandemic, though they certainly were, but that it was social weaknesses, um, you know, fault lines in the way our societies run that were amplified by the pandemic. So, I mean, I think what Ricardo was saying is that, you know, as children um, and the lack of commitment to education, um, which did horrible things. Um, I think here, the fact that we don't have a health system, um, and then when you say, go ask your doctor, I mean, what are the people who, don't have a regular doctor, which was very large numbers of Americans. What are they supposed to do? So, you know, that was a glaring hole in American social structure. Um, America doesn't really want to have a safety net. Um, so, you know, it may be prepared to spend large sums of money on transfers during what is clearly an emergency, even to the most rigid hardliner. Um, but I don't think they want to keep that stuff going. Um, but still, maybe we'll get some things that will be better as a result of this. So, Thomas, thank you very much. Um, this has been terrific. It's good to see Ricardo again. I don't think I've seen him for 30 years. Um, but um, it was a lot of fun to do this. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much yeah, for like all the kind of food for thought you provided and uh, uh, for agreeing to be here. Thank you uh, uh, a lot to uh, both Angus and, and Ricardo. Uh, so my one thing is, is an answer to Angus, like we, we certainly could do a thing with eight and people from eight and countries kind of shared experience and we could do it through the Brazil lab, why not, right? Uh, uh, so yeah, I just want to uh, thank again both our speakers, thank everybody at home uh, who watched um, uh, online and sent questions. And, and just a reminder uh, of our next event is next week. Uh, so, so since we're very much an interdisciplinary event, there's a shift of gears. So uh, our next event will also be on this YouTube channel uh, is, uh, uh, will be October 6th, so Wednesday at 12.30. Uh, we'll have uh, our longtime collaborator Lydia Schwartz, Iggy Ayedung, and Jaime Laureano talking about a very uh, uh, interesting project on Black, called the Black Encyclopedia, which is a set of Afro-Brazilian biographies. So uh, thanks everyone and yeah, uh, stay safe.